welcome to those of you who are here. Um, we've got a, a guest today from Kansas State University, uh, Laszlo Kulchar, who is, uh, has been, uh, I like to point out, uh, at various times a freelance journalist, a pollster, a research consultant, uh, but is now a professor of sociology at the Department of uh, Sociology, Anthropology, and Social Work at K-State, and he specializes in uh, migration, urbanization, regional development. He's done research on population dynamics and social change in rural areas, focusing on aging and natural resource use, and has also done a lot of work, of course, on uh, demography and uh, the transition in uh, post-communist uh, Eastern Europe. So, we have news today. All right, thank you so much. So now I'll try to hold it. Okay, so um, the project I'm going to talk about today is uh, a book in the making. It's about the culture war in Eastern Europe. And um, some stuff I kind of like lifted from that project to, to to talk about specifically on Hungary, but it's going to be about other countries as well. Okay, so I guess most people recognize all the coats of arms Hungary had in the past hundred years. It nicely sort of like summarizes the country's development through the ups and downs of various ideological thoughts. Okay, so um, three pictures on various ideology failures in Hungary. I'm sure you know who this person is. It's Admiral Horthy, you know, the famous leader in the interwar period. And this is an iconic picture, not because of him being an admiral, when Hungary actually had no like navy or something <laughs> times. But the really important thing is the white horse that somehow became this big symbol that he rode in a white horse and to save Hungary after a trianon, blah blah blah. And then I never really noticed but you know it looks like the horse knows what's going on. And the horse, you know, out that the horse is, you know, it looks like Mr. Ed. Right, like, you know, it's, that's, that's the real story, I guess. And then you have all those faceless people, you know, dressed in red and everything else that you know um, came during the communist era. And most recently, we have this guy. Um, so that's sort of like a satirical um, weekly paper in Hungary uh, called Hotsipö. That means um, snowshoe. But we have this saying that, you know, uh, I had enough of my snowshoe, which means that I really had enough of everybody. Um, and of course, that's Viktor Orban. That's him in 1989 when he made that really famous speech at the burial of Imran Hajj. And that really made him this very sort of like charismatic leader of the transformation. And this is him today. And it said, the title says, uh, he does not deserve any more chances. And that was made back in 2014, February 14, right before the elections and right before he rewrote the electoral law to keep himself in office, pretty much regardless of the outcome of the election. So, kind of like, you know, how the mighty have fallen, I guess. Mm. That's the story of the 1990s. Okay, so um, uh, just a, some outline about political identity in Eastern Europe. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the work of Ivan Berend. Um, the Hungarian historian um, in California, he came up with this term incomplete societies, which reflects Eastern Europe as being kind of like belated um, development um, region um, because of late industrialization and very weak urban traditions. We did not have those urban classes that Western European countries had. That made the landowner aristocracy the idea adapting and transmitting class, which means that everything that was supposed to be modernizing the country had to go through the aristocracy you know, whose wealth was mostly in line, and of course that created all this interesting angle by which they thought about modernization in the first place. And then, you know, very little um, uh, social mobility and the very close elite reproduction. So it's not like you could make it, it's not a land of opportunity that you can rise in rank significantly, um, but it was a fairly close elite class for most of the 20th century. Um, Exotism, that's kind of like the dominance of the state um, because the, only the state has enough resources and power to carry out agendas. And that's why like capturing the state gives access to the elite, uh, uh, to all of this wealth and power to use it, whatever they want to use it. And at the same time, the state provides all kinds of tools to monopolize the discussion about national culture and identity which is actually always based on the elite's own ideology and identity. So, we are the elite because we are great and we capture the state, therefore what does it mean to be Hungarian is exactly what we tell you what it means to be Hungarian and that's pretty much who we are. Kind of easy um, point to make if you have all the tools. Um, 
as always in Eastern Europe, identity is always built on righteousness and superiority. I mean, every Eastern European country is better than other Eastern European countries, you know, and that's particularly true for Hungarians for a number of reasons. And because of that righteousness, you know, the elite often uses emotions and references to traditions and values and like the great old times when we were such and such. And now this is what you need to sign up for. Okay. Um, the three periods of this discourse in Hungary, you know, the interwar period or before the Second World War, which is really about constructing the national identity, especially after the fall of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, and all these narratives about history and culture that goes back like a thousand years, things like that. It's very grandiose. And then we've got the communist period, which is this extreme makeover of identity based on you know what was said in Moscow with a centralized promotion slash coercion of ideology. So it's not like this is what you should think, which was the case in, in the interwar period. It's also this is what you should think, and if you don't think that, then you're going to then bad things are gonna happen. Um, and in the post-socialist period, that is like trying to return the legitimate cultural roots, understanding that, well, this was not who we were, this was really put on top of us, this is not what we wanted, so let's go back to who we were, and that creates all these kinds of issues. At the same time, you know, facing all these challenges from global Western culture and Europeanization. So the 1990s is not just about, we got rid of communism, finally, great, it's also about, we cannot just go back to who we were, because we always have to address the new sort of like um, transnational challenges about our own culture. All right. So the conceptual origins of you know this goes. I'm sure you're familiar with this um, very much um, Buchanan speech and then all this debate about culture wars. And the idea here is that it's not about the economy or things that actually matter. It's always about things that should be um, private choices and somehow these are elevated to the public discourse level and these are used as, as um, like cover discourses or narratives uh, to hide important things and important failures. In that particular case, you can recognize all the, the hot topic issues that are driving all electoral debates, among, which is really silly, I think. And then this whole idea of portraying this radical left and the cultural elite in the US versus the Christian majority and then but the important thing here is that it's you know, move morality from an individual to a public political issue. So now we can actually talk about like what is your stance on gun rights? What is your stance on gay rights? And that defines a candidate. And that's just wrong because those should be private issues um, from that perspective. But of course, we go back in time, and then this, this is where it's really started. Um, the Pope and Bismarck playing chess. It's all about this late 19th century um, nation building exercise, um, partly the unification of Italy and Germany, and then all these nationalism outbreaks in Eastern Europe, and then identity constructed as, you know, based on blood and cultural similarities as opposed to a joint understanding of civic liberties, which was most likely English and French case. Um, what made it really unique is really Bismarck because he used the state and all the state power for the first time to push for a certain cultural position. And that was the culture comp of the largely unsuccessful um, anti-Catholic policies. And to be honest, Bismarck was never really interested in the cultural aspect of that. For him, it was a political game. And it was a game that he actually lost. But then this whole idea that you can use culture to mobilize people for particular reasons, that was really rooted in that period. And because that period was the period of you know, liberal politics rising and the secularization of Europe, that's, that was the reason why this cultural debate got this entire religious sort of like labor. Interesting historical period. So, going back to Hungary, um, I'm sure you recognize the trauma of Hungary. Wow, you know, bad things happened. So all of our narratives start with Trianon, right? You know, we were great for a thousand years, and then the evil English and French and all these Western powers, you know, took away most of the country, blah, 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 blah. So the story here is that one way to handle that, and that was a significant one, one way to handle that was to escape into this idea that we are culturally superior. We may be small, we may be the smallest now, we used to be the biggest, we used to be like the bullies, we don't have, we are not the bullies anymore, we are kind of like tiny, but our culture is still strong. Um, and that, of course, means um, all kinds of interesting um, changes. 
One of those is that with the kind of like dismemberment of Hungary, most of the urban centers that were significant for hundreds of years belong to other countries now. So what happened is that Budapest remained the only real city with significant commerce and industry and all these urban you know, like, uh, amenities. And as such, it became the most important center of modernist thought. So everybody who wanted to create social progress and modernism was in Budapest. Right? Now that sort of pitted the city against the countryside and created this complex label of, well, Budapest is really about these Jewish intellectuals, sort of like urbanite, liberal, bad things, and all of those people who live there are just like these evil urbanites and they don't care about the true Hungarian values, blah, blah, blah. It's not a familiar argument, like all the time, it's always like the urbanites are like this man. And then the real Hungarians, I guess, live in the countryside. So because of that, modernity, represented by Budapest, became the main target for all these conservative political forces and the populists as well. And you know, Budapest was really big. It was 10 times as big as the second largest city in Hungary at that time, which is a lot. I mean, that really gives you a perspective on how different things are. OK, um, this guy with the hat, that's Kuno Klebersberg, you know, the culture minister of Hungary in the 1920s. And that's one of the graduation ceremonies at the uh, University of Budapest. And these two guys, the ones who did not do not have any swords, are, you know, I think one of the rector and there's the provost or the other way around. So those are university dignitaries. Everybody else with like the sword and the traditional garb that's like you know, important government people. Except the guy who is actually responsible for all this, who always wore civilian. Anyhow, so he was Kuno Petersberg, the Minister of Culture for most of the 20s, and he had this famous quote, today the Hungarian nation is kept great not by the sword, but by its culture. And that really sort of like created this new narrative of, well, we'd like to get those territories back, we cannot right now because of obvious reasons, but then we're just gonna colonize them through our culture. We're gonna swamp them through our culture. The ministry received, whoops, close to 10%, of the national budget in the late 20s. So that is a lot. I mean, the whole national budget, 10% went to the Ministry of Culture, which is, it's not like the Ministry of Truth or something like that, but it's kind of like really significant. And, you know, he had this dual vision, you know, first improve public um, education and then support higher education and the intellectual elite as long as the intellectual elite says what he wants to hear, right? But then public elementary and secondary education, that was very, very important because even at that time, Hungary was really low, not so much on literacy and basic things, but vocational you know, skills and, and things like that. Um, actually, two of my grandparents got their teacher's degrees in the 1920s, part of that huge you know, infusion of state money um, into public education, which is pretty good, I think. Make the money for it. Okay, so, um, the competing ideologies back in those, time, those times, the 20s and 30s, were this Christian conservative um, narrative um, that was the favorite for the government. Um, it's a really good match for this revisionist atmosphere, like let's get you know, all these territories back because it's our God-given right and has been around and we saved Europe many, many times from the Turks and the Tatars and all of these you know, reinterpreting our history uh, exercises. And that was actually shared by most of the general public. So it's not like people were resisting. People really did buy into that idea. Particularly those people who left those territories that were now assigned to other countries, you know, ethnic Hungarians who went back to Hungary, mostly in the 20s. The liberal modernist tradition that was really close, sort of like um, confined to Budapest, and um, uh, was mostly around this literary journal called Nugat, which means West, and those were the most important um, you know, poets and, and writers and so sociologists, these type of people, really kind of like understood um, what this is. And then the populist policies or politics, which was all about traditions in a less Christian sense. It was all about the, the roots of the rural identity of Hungary and all of those great people who lived there. And sometimes they actually did advocate for social justice. Now that was seen as a third way against these two, but that's kind of like a false way of looking at it because in many cases that was captured by these right-wing movements, um, sort of like a homegrown fascists came from that particle arena and not necessarily 
from the Christian conservative ideology, because that was very much status quo, that you know, was really serving the elite, they did not want to give up all that power, so all of the radical stuff came from this um, area. Okay, so then came our friends from Moscow. So um, I was, I love these, you know, flyers, it's just fascinating, I'm looking into the wind and look, is it a plane? Is it a bird? <laughs> so, but it, it really tells you a lot of things, you know, like um, workers, they go on the top, you know, agriculture, second, intellectual, sort of like third. So the way how they're positioned in the picture, and of course we have Matyash Rakoshi, or sort of a local Stalin, uh, he was called the bold pig, um, of course not openly, but he was just like that. And then this one is actually really tricky because that's, sort of like a celebration of August 20 uh, as Constitution Day. Now, up to that point, August 20 was uh, St. Stephen's Day for like a thousand years. The idea was that this is the day when we celebrate the first Hungarian king. And it was so entrenched in Hungarian identity that you know they said, well, you know, let's do something. Let's just have a special session in the parliament and we should vote on the new constitution on the same exact day, and then we're gonna turn this into Constitution Day. And that was very easy because the new constitution was actually like 95% translation of the Soviet constitution at that time. So it wasn't new, just like, we just had to translate from Russian and then blah, 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 we had it. And of course everybody's happy and laughing and it's like a nice future. It's really interesting. It was probably one of those um, pictures that was made in a rush. If you look at that flag, so the top is red, then it's white, and who knows what's in the bottom, likely nothing, because it should be Hungarian, a Soviet, a Hungarian, a Soviet, so there has to be this order. And probably the person who drew this up made a mistake, he started or she started with the Hungarian one, and then somebody never got fixed. Um, so he went to the Gulag. Anyhow, so uh, what happened during the socialist period? Well, there was this huge, you know, complete turnover of political ideology. Uh, it started with the elimination or co-optation of the cultural elite. Not everybody was sent to camps. Not everybody was, you know, forced to um, emigrate. Some people decided that, well, fine, I can work within the system. And those people were rewarded with, you know, roles and positions and things like that. And then the implementation of the uniform identity and culture, saying that whatever you guys thought, you know, about your own identity, you know, we are done with that, we developed ourselves into a greater sort of like substance, or God knows what, and therefore this is your culture now, whether you like it or not. Um, Ethicism 2.0, I mean, it was still the state, so just because the ideology has changed, you know, the situation when the state was the one with most of the power has not. So the state still defined, you know, culture, identity, ideology, it was all about, and even more so because, you know, you know, communism works, it's always about the state and the parts. The public discourse and anything like that was tightly controlled. So, if, you know, if you said nasty things or said some things that people did not like, then you were reported and eventually, again, bad things went your way. The important consequence of that was the desocialization of the identity discourse itself. So, by the 1960s, people figured out that, you know, whatever, we're going to do the parades and the May 1st celebrations and the glorious days of the God knows what revolution and fine, whatever, I don't care, I'm just going to go with the motions, raise my hand or wave the flag and then I go home, drink my beer and eat sausage or whatever. So what that means is that they really became uninterested in identity as a discourse. So especially after 1956, when they knew that, all right, you know, this thing is here to stay for a long time, it really doesn't make any sense to revolt against that. So I'm just going to give up and focus on things that are actually important for me. And that was mostly material interest and private life. In the late 60s, early 70s, the state was still rich enough to provide those new things for the citizens. And then the citizens were really happy that the, the first repression period ended, and now they can sort of like enjoy life as much as they can. It also meant that there was an increasing importance of private life. So compared to the 1950s, when you were supposed to do things in collectives, you were supposed to go out in the public and demonstrate that you're such a great comrade and you love everybody, especially the great leaders, blah, blah, blah. In the 1970s, nobody cared about that. So most of the focus was like, yeah, I'll do those motions, but what really matters is what I do in my private home. And that's really 
value, really put a significant value on private life. And that's where the resistance to, well, I don't want the state intruding my, into my private life came from, which then was carried on by the 1990s as well. Okay, so then what happened by the end of sort of like the communist period is that the original three schools, you know, the, the liberal, modernist, the Christian, conservative, and the populist ones, were completely isolated. So there wasn't any conceptual development in those political thoughts between the 1950s and the 1980s, because they were pushed underground. So that means that they missed all of the global discourses that went on about what is conservatism, what is liberalism, what is, you know, what is socialism for that matter. Right? So when people had to start over, then the 1930s was the last time where things were written about, where things were discussed. Um, so that's, that was the period they could uh, go back. And then, of course, it also created this really powerful cultural enemy, which was communism itself, which has become a political stigma, just like fascist was in 1947 you know, or 48 or so. I mean, if you're a communist, it's like a bad thing. Um, so this is the House of Terror. Have you heard about that? So that's this new place of indoctrination in Hungary. I mean, it's a state-sponsored museum that supposedly shows all the bad things that the totalitarian ideologies um, have done to the country. And you can see the two symbols up there, um, the star, of course, and the arrow cross. And that is a very interesting choice. So first of all, um, have you been there? OK. So uh, for those of you who haven't been there, I mean, it's kind of like a somewhat unbalanced display of the terrors of the communism get like this and the terrors of like arrow cross fascist movements yeah, yeah that was there too um, but the interesting thing is what they have done you know singling out the arrow cross movement as like a comparable evil to communism they only singled out a very small segment of the interwar history and a very small group of Hungarian society namely Ferenc Salvashi and his cronies that were mostly executed after the Second World War as like the villains. And whatever Admiral Horty and the others have done, that was suddenly okay. That was just like combat compared to these guys, that was really peanuts. But you know, thinking about the long-term development of the country, that was bad enough itself. So this is a very interesting way of thinking about equating evils and then creating a narrative which says that, you know, we are completely balanced because they don't say that the arrow cross was right. It was just as wrong as communism. But communism, you know, you could have like the entire country sort of like stigmatized for that because everybody participated in some shape or form. That one, you stigmatize a tiny segment of the population that are mostly dead by now and some really radical idiots who currently follow that ideology and then people always point it out like, yeah, you know, we arrested them because, you know, we are like super balanced. So it's a very interesting way of thinking about you know, the narrative now. So, um, some old pictures. So that's still Viktor Orban. Um, that's uh, Jörg Sabat, um, who was the first speaker of the house after the 1990 transition. And that's Jozef Antal, the first prime minister who died in 1993. And those two guys were in the same party in this sort of like center-right conservative party or the Democratic Forum, and of course Orban was the leader of the Fidesz at that time, and that was before sort of like the transition. It says Alenziki Karapaskal, which means the opposition round table. That was during those negotiations with all the opposition groups got together and negotiated with the communists about like, well, how should we do this thing? Now this thing is more tricky because it was the election sort of like um, sign of the Fidesz in 1990, it says, please make your choice. And of course, that's Brezhnev and Bonecker sharing a you know, comrade kiss, and that's two random young people sharing a much nicer kiss. So it was really part it was really kind of like this generational thing, and uh, you know, it was all very unique in many ways. But that picture tells a lot about this guy, because he showed up as a liberal in the early 1990s, but that was not who he was really. I mean, he's always been this closet sort of like pseudo-fascist kind of like bully, kind of like a crossover between 
Chris Christie and Putin with the sort of like the <laughs> comedic value of Benito Mussolini. That's kind of like. <laughs> and and uh, it was very interesting that when they lost the 1994 election on the liberal platform, he purged all the liberal elements from the party like overnight, and he turned into conservative and said, "That's fine, you know." We could not make it as liberals, now we're going to do this as conservatives, and that, you know, proved to be really uh, a good choice for him. For the country, that was a really bad choice, but for him it is a good choice. Okay, so, um, what's about this discourse? <clears throat> well, all these dynamics were really new. I mean, you have to rediscover the rules, figure out who we were, you know, reach back to the last legitimate era of our discourse. We're talking about pluralism, that there are multiple opinions, and you can, you know, contrast those opinions and address all these, you know, globalization, Western values, um, etc. However, the weaponry itself has not changed a bit because it was still about using the state to promote a certain ideology. That was the case between 1990 and 1994, the first conservative government. That was really hardcore in Hungary. It was somewhat less sort of like hardcore during the, the socialist era between 94 and 98, it's more like this anything goes type, but then they still had their own vision. You know, uh, strong intrusion to private morality, it's like now it's our time to renounce our bad ways and go back to the Christian traditional rules that made this country great 900 years ago. Blah, blah, blah. And of course, the way how you sell this, and again, if you live through those times, it's super confusing. I mean, you're really happy that communism fell, yippee. But then, like, what now? And then people were, like, totally in the dark. So therefore, they had to be addressed by very simplified political messages, which says that, you know, two legs bad, four legs great, or the other way around, right? So it's something that everybody can understand immediately, right? And that's how they use this kind of, you know, references back to the historical glory and, and values and all. Okay. Um, it was very much elite driven. Um, and of course, if it's elite driven, it comes with this temptation of, you know, I'm the elite, I'm the elite because now I was actually voted to be the elite as opposed to the communist times when I was appointed by Moscow. Now I was voted, so I have all the legitimacy of the populace and they all love me. Of course, then, you know, this comes with this messianistic kind of like, this is how I think the country should look like. So we are the chosen ones, um, both politically and intellectually, because why else would they vote for me? I'm the smartest person in the world. I know the best, you know, what's, what's good for the country. And then simple slogans. An increasingly bitter fight for the control of the media that was very typical in Eastern Europe um, up to about 97, 98, when um, market principles were introduced in the media and then the foreign capital could move in and set up their own TV stations and suddenly people could choose what they want to watch, and they did not want to watch the political debates, they wanted to watch, you know, some Western movie, so that's kind of like put an end to that. But before that, in the early 1990s, that was one of the typical characteristics of all Eastern European transitions, is that it's the fight for the TV, especially for the TV. It's like, who, because who controls the mass media, controls the discourse, and controls sort of like the identity. And then let's reinterpret history, um, all this symbolism and righteousness and again temptation to address that this is what you should do because our forefathers have done um, God knows what. You know, eat up everybody and but that's not something we are really proud of. Um, the simultaneous fight against these domestic opponents because if I'm the person who knows this the best, then the other person who got fewer votes than I got must be sort of like the bad person. So I mean the fact that I was elected justifies my treatment of the other party as basically a bunch of idiots. And then the international menace, and that is mostly financial, you know, because of you know countries being in a really bad shape, it gives rise to this new anti-Semitic, there's this sort of conspiracy between New York and Tel Aviv and all those Jewish bankers that are just out there to get us. Um, and of course political because of this globalization and Western values and you know restaurant signs, you know, written in English as opposed to in Hungarian and all those sort of things. It's kind of silly, but in that atmosphere that was this oh, I have to do something. Okay. So there's life outside the EU. That's a saying from Viktor Orban. You know, at one point they tried to discipline him 
and then he got mad and started like, well, F you, there's life outside the EU, I don't need to follow the EU sort of directives. And um, that's a flyer from before the uh, referendum on the EU, and it's very interesting because it says that you can say no, you can say no to. And of course, you know, it kind of equates all of these three major ideologies that they try to say that it's a bad influence on Hungary, and because we sort of like uh, bow to each of them, then we got what we deserve. And then it's kind of like, I don't know, I mean, it's not exactly what the EU thinks of himself, I guess, really sad. This one is even more tricky. This party, uh, Jopin, that's our homegrown fascist party. So um, basically, I mean, it, I really love this because these guys are really creative. I mean, I hate these guys because most of them are idiots, but in terms of creativity. So basically, it says that it doesn't matter which one you suck. And then that's, that's kind of this word joke because in Hungary, the word for smoking a cigarette and sucking as the same thing as sucking in English is the same, it's seed. So when you're smoking a cigarette, it's, you're actually sucking a cigarette, and then they play on that one. And of course you can see in the, in the packet or all the other parties except them. So it's kind of equating everybody you know, who was in the political platform up to that point is, well, you guys, it doesn't matter. I mean, you could, there is no difference between those. And then it says that the, it's sort of like the, the label on cigarette packs, says that the EU um, is very harmful for the health of you and your homeland. So it's kind of like, hmm, I don't know, interesting. The other, all the other um, slogan they had was uh, 20 years for 20 years. And the idea was that everybody who was responsible for the past 20 years should be in prison for 20 years. So I mean, you can imagine how people like, you know, especially around like 2010, it was for the 2010 election. 2010 is like 20 years after the transition, they still don't live better, they still have all these troubles, like, you know, we had enough of all these you know, sort of yahoos who were playing us for 20 years and then filling their pockets with all that money. Let's move over to the real Hungarians, you know, like crypto fishes. That's anyhow, so there's life outside the EU. I don't know, I mean, if that's the life, I'm not sure if that's the life I really want, but, you know, it is what it is. Okay, so who are we? And that kind of gave um, rise to this industry of defining what Hungarian is. Because after some point, you have to do this professionally. You cannot just go on TV as the great leader and tell that, well, I think that Hungarian is... Mm. No, it has to be done professionally. So nation branding is a marketing exercise of some sort. It's complete bogus. I mean, it's just like as bad as it gets. It grew out of this destination branding um, industry. It's only promoted by marketing professionals because it makes a whole lot of money for them. It's entirely pseudo-scientific. They have these indicators of like, in the nation branding index, Malaysia moved up like two places since last year. It's like, based on what? I don't know. It's like the Freedom House rankings. You know, like, freedom of journalism based on, I don't know. It's like really super subjective. Actually, Freedom House beats this one by a mile, which is saying a lot. Um, Eastern European buyers still lined up a lot because they have the Western expertise to get rid of these unwanted labors as communists or backward or undeveloped or Dracula land or you know, things like that. And then they think of if they can craft the message in a, in a language that Western investors will understand, then they will be much more successful bringing in FBI. Of course, all these new tools could be used for other purposes. So there are two versions of that in Hungary in the post-socialist era. The minimalist was by these leftist liberal governments. The idea is on products, what they call Hungaricums, that is uniquely Hungarian stuff, um, and some places. So that's Hortobad, obviously all Hungarians do this like all the time. <laughs> And of course, all Hungarians eat like this all the time. Um, it's mostly about booze, and that's unicorn, which is actually that's the real thing. Um, I'm not sure about the cheese thing, how that got there, but whatever. Maybe it's not cheese. I don't know. Okay, strange. Of course, women. I mean, there cannot be any promotion without some semi-naked woman. Um, so, um, it's places, products. There is no connection to political discourse. It's all about things that we give to people who come here. And it's promoting the country as a destination, and it's promoting it to foreigners. So this whole narrative is not for the locals, it's for like 
outside to come to us and enjoy and embrace all these things that we have. And because of that, the coordination fell on this government agency on tourism. And they got all this money, they made these like, ad campaigns and whatnot, and it was like, mm -hmm. okay, oh, yeah. it is what it is. Now, the other version, the maximalist version by conservatives was very, very different. So in that, it's, well, they still do the products and places, but then they turn this into political battles. Palinka more, have you heard about that? So Palinka is brandy in Hungarian, right? So in Romania, it is the same word, except with a C instead of a K, right? So then, but it pronounced the same. And then when the Romanians try to sell their own brandy under this name, then the Hungarian government sued them at the EU, saying that, well, you cannot use that because that word in itself, Alinka, that's an ancient Hungarian word, and it has to be associated with the Hungarian product, and you cannot have that. And I don't know what was the end of that, it's some sort of silly thing. Operation Tokai was then, then they realized that part of the Tokai wine region is actually now in Slovakia. And then the Slovaks tried to brand their wines from that same actual region, wine region, as Tokajski or something like that. And then I was like, no, Tokaj, that's this Hungarian thing, we cannot have that. And actually that was something that, that Hungary has won at the EU, saying that we could prove that we had a claim because of like a thousand years ago we did something and that was like really good. Okay, so the main emphasis is on this symbolism, this identity things. As you could see down here, so that's the, the crown of Saint Stephen that used to be in the Museum of Hungarian History or National History Museum. And then in the, during the first reign of Viktor Orban, he thought that, well, this should be actually in the parliament. So we removed it from the museum, which is a couple of blocks from the parliament, and during this very celebratory process, they walked it over to the parliament. And that's equivalent of taking the Constitution from the National Archives and walking it to Capitol Hill to be on display. So it's like in the first case, like in the archives in DC and, and for us in the National Museum, that belongs to the whole country, regardless of any political setup. Once it gets into the parliament, it is, I mean, the parliament is sort of a representation of everybody, sure, whatever. But then it really expresses who controls the parliament, controls the identity. It's very symbolic and it's yeah, in many cases it doesn't look like that for the first, but you know, Eastern Europeans and Hungarians in particular, we, we really do that double thing. We can like read between the lies and then between the lies some more, and then it's all about symbolic meaning. So it's like, wow, you know, we're actually colonizing it. That thing up there is the severed right hand of Saint Stephen. That's the only thing that remained from the first king because the medieval tombs were destroyed during the Turkish Wars. So. Um, that's in this really um, uh, nice um, container in the St. Stephen Basilica. You can just go there and take a look at it. It's very cool. Um, as much as I can could be. I know my kids really like it. And then they're like, this is really cool. So, and every August 20, there is this sort of like um, procession that goes around the basilica and they display it. That's the only time when you can see it outside of the, of the church and it's like, you know, as you can see by the clothes and everything, it's like really celebratory. But it, it also signifies not just sort of like the foundation of the state, it signifies our Christian sort of like roots and Christianity as a superior ideology compared to anything else. And so state sponsored, of course, through the churches. And that's, you know, what that is. It's kind of interesting that they light it up in, in um, holidays, but you can see that only from the Buddha side, right? So that's where the potentates are, not the plebs, you know, living in the fascist side. It's not the like the view that they So the interesting thing about this one is that it was really targeting the domestic population. So nation branding during the conservative governments was not about, well, let's sell Unicum, or not about Palinka. It's about defining identity in a certain way, and they created a specific government agency to sell this to the locals. So it's all about indoctrination of who we are and who we should be as Hungarians. Okay, so a couple of points. So it's a long and winding road from state-sponsored Christianity to state-sponsored communism to whatever it is today. I guess we're going back to state-sponsored state Christianity. Um, so conservatism was frozen in the 1930s state, and that was really anachronistic 
until about the late 1990s when Orban came up with this idea that it's going to be the new conservatism. We don't really go back to Admiral Horthy and all of those things. It's this brand new modern vision of like, you know, whoever, you know, the person we should put there. Um, now that led to re review the far right. And that was because they said that, you know, it's really all about the old roots. And they did not like Orban very much for modernizing conservatism. So that gave her first the um, Istvan Turka and the Mie, which is like this clearly anti-Semitic uh, party, and now Jobbik, which is mostly running an anti-Roma platform. And that's actually, that was, again, a very smart move from them, because they understood that if it's just anti-Semitic, that's not going to make a big splash. I mean, Mie always got like 4 to 5 percent, so that's a resident anti-Semitic population in Hungary. So you can always count on their votes, because they are just like, hate everybody. Once you move that over to anti-Roma, then you got 20 percent of the votes. Because that's a much easier argument to make, that they're all criminals and cheat and steal and all of this kind of thing, which of course is not true, but that still that can get you 20 percent. Um, the left was pretty much discredited after 1990 because that was associated with communism, so it had to be this really long transition for the successor uh, party of the Communist Party to rebrand itself into like a center-left socialist party. And then, they, during that, they incorporated the liberals, which was a marriage made in hell, because it did not really legitimize the left, but it completely discredited the liberals. And many of the liberals were the most fiercely anti-communist opposition movements before 1990. So for everybody, like, for those guys to get in bed with the successor party of the communists was like, you're done, you're done. And it only took one electoral cycle to completely vote them out of existence. So um, you know, people do stuff for money, and that was a very short-term strategy. And then, of course, all these complex identity questions, um, because you could not really discuss them in a complex way, because complexity is lost on most people. They don't understand those things. I mean, they need simple messages, like, you're the good guy, you're the bad guy. So because of that, we got all these simplified narratives and answers to all questions. So that went on with this long legacy of top-down approaches. So it's never like this organic identity building up from the populace. We always like whoever was in power decided how the discourse should run. Of course, that was using state resources. Um, and again, this infallibility and righteousness, and this is how things should be. Um, just like the culture war in the US, these became fundamental parts of the political discourse. You cannot really make a case against the EU. You cannot really make a case against foreign direct investment, things like that. Well, you can always make a case against the Roma or the gays. That's very easy. And then people will be happy to give you their vote. And that resulted in this really strange situation, and there is no middle ground in being Hungarian. Because if the left is in power, they underplay it to revive this sort of cosmopolitan modernist position. So it's like, we're, we're no longer like that. You know, let's just get rid of that and embrace our Europeanness and global identity and all that jazz. And, you know, not many people like that. Conservatives then overdo because they need to cover everything else. They need to use this one argument because this is the one thing that really sort of like makes them stick out in the crowd. And because of that, they are completely unable to move it beyond this Messiah martyr. So it's still like, oh no, all the bad things that happened to Hungary, despite all the great things we have done, it's just like complete unfairness and all of that stuff. So it's very difficult to, to be this middle ground Hungarian, because if you're in Hungary, you're expected to take each of those two positions. Which then means that the party structure is actually being simplified into the same Way. So we started out with six parties in the parliament in 1990 with clearly different ideologies and agendas. Now they got into like two mainstream sort of like political groups, just like in the US. Either both party A or party B. I'm not sure that works very well in Hungary. And that's the last thing. I love this. This is like so unique. So that's a cartoon <laughs> from 1993. Right, so it's it says you know views from the parliament, you know from the inside, from the outside. And of course, from the inside, it's all sheep. From the outside, it's and it's again this the Hungarian language, the word for cattle in Hungary, which is marka. 
is the same as idiot. So that verb has two meanings. <laughs> very nice to the right, right, right. <laughs> Poor Kato, you know, like, yeah, right. sticking out like, ah, no. <laughs> So that, that, that gives justice to the sort of post-socialist discourse. Paul, well, anyway, thank you.